Bojo, Wache, Anin. Welcome to Lakehead University's Winter Storytelling with Isaac Murdoch. We are happy that you could join us. Denise Baxter and Dishnikas, Makwadotam, Martin Falls, and Donjaba. My name is Denise Baxter, Vice Provost, Indigenous Initiatives at Lakehead University, and I will be your MC for your event today. Lakehead University respectfully acknowledges that its campuses are located on the traditional lands of Indigenous peoples. Lakehead University, Thunder Bay is located on the traditional lands of Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Spear Treaty of 1850. Lake Aurelia is located on the traditional territory, uh, territory of the Anishinaabe, and the Anishinaabe include the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Lakehead University acknowledges the history that many nations hold in the areas around our campuses and is committed to a relationship with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples based on the principles of mutual trust, respect, reciprocity, and collaboration in the spirit of reconciliation. Before we begin, I would like to quickly run through some housekeeping items. Uh, it is important to note today that the uh, video and audio recording of this winter storytelling event with Isaac Murdoch. Participants are reminded that this is an online event is being recorded and it will be shared in our Indigenous initiatives pages um, at a later date. So thank you for joining us. Um, all participants are muted. I had a question from somebody in the chat, uh, just to ensure that we have seamless continuity throughout the event. There will be a Q&A following Isaac's talk at approximately 1230. Um, and participants can ask questions through the chat option. And then I'll be moderating those questions um, as we go. It is my pleasure today to introduce Elder Beatrice Twansheins from Bittagong Anishinaabeg, who will share an opening song and prayer. Elder Beatrice. Hi, Bojo. Uh, I'm really honored to be here. So I already smudged my drum and myself. So I have the, the smudge here available, which I'll send out to, to the four directions and out to the universe, to you. Oh, oh, bojo, minwa, gijem nido, mishom suck, nok misak, denoe maginak, wabish ko bebego jimanito, equine indigenicas, kichimigizi, equine indigenicas, gaye, makwa, do dame, beak to gong, donji, and my given name is Beatrice. Hello again, creator, grandfathers, grandmothers, all my relations. My name is White Horse Spirit Woman. I'm also called Big Eagle Woman, and I'm from the Bear Clan. And I'm from Big Tikong, uh, First Nation near Pick River. Thank you, Creator, for the beautiful, beautiful gift of today, for the beauty of your creation, and to me, which to all the all the uh, coordinators at the university for coordinating this, and for Isaac uh, for sharing his stories uh, uh, from the ancestors. So, I'd like to thank you, and uh, Creator, we ask you to. Uh, help us to do what we can to uh, keep ourselves safe so that we can keep our children safe uh, from that uh, uh, virus. So, and we pray that the vaccines will be available to us soon. Miigwech, Creator. Miigwech. Um, you know, I'm going to sing the, the creation song. And it's in Ojibwe. So uh, it, it's uh, as... as as I'm walking, it says I'm I'm talking talking to the Creator that's Jamie and Ado, uh, and Mishomis is grandfather, Nokimis Nan, grandmother, Shkog Mikoy, that's uh, Mother Earth, Wesiak, that's the animals, Mitigok, the the trees, Anangoka, that's the stars. So I want to share that with you, okay. And I see that uh, Isaac is going to be sharing some uh, creation stories with you. So we had that we had that connection. That's a song I picked, and which is good, you know. So miigwech. Hey, 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 oh. 
So uh, prayer is my song. So I want to say, um, I, like, I would love to stay with you to uh, listen to the stories, but I do have to prepare for a Zoom session all afternoon. So I do have to leave you. So I wish you all the best. So miigwech, minua. Miigwech, Elder Beatrice. Always a pleasure to, to see you virtually lately and also to hear your, your beautiful song. So miigwech. Oh, miigwech, miigwech. Um, it is my pleasure now to introduce Isaac Murdoch. Um, Isaac Murdoch is from Serpent River First Nation. He grew up in the traditional setting of hunting, fishing, and trapping. Many of these years were spent learning from elders in the northern regions of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Isaac is a well-respected as a storyteller and traditional knowledge holder. For many years, he has led various workshops and cultural camps that focuses on the transfer of knowledge to youth. Other areas of expertise include traditional Ojibwe paint, imagery, symbolism, harvesting, medicine walks, and ceremonial knowledge, cultural camps, Anishinaabe oral history, birch bark canoe making, birch bark scrolls, and youth and elder workshops, to name a few. He has committed his life to the preservation of Anishinaabe cultural practices and has spent years learning directly from elders. It is my great honor to introduce Mr. Isaac Murdoch. Um, so I will pass it over to him. Isaac? Ani, uh, first off, I just want to thank uh, the elder for the beautiful song um, and for the prayers. That's, that's so important and that's so beautiful. And it's such a, an amazing way to start off our storytelling and our, what we're going to be talking about. And so I know you have work to do, but before you go, uh, we just want to extend our blessings back to you as well. That you've given to us and that song was really beautiful and uh, we wish you just a an amazing day and a beautiful day and we we thank you so much for being with us and and starting us off in such a good way so chimi glitch thank you oh miigwech no my name is the man who paints the rocks and uh, it's an old name that I was given a long time ago. I come from the place where the serpents are painted on the rocks. And I'm from the fish clan, the, the pike clan. I am, I am Ojibwe, I'm Anishinaabe. Giken Mananik, Gawin. We ka. We no minan dan zina wan. Get a knock nagewa nanan in. 
No, we know that the laws of the land are, are have not been followed uh, prop properly. Wasiwak, metegog, gigowak. You know that the trees, the animals, the fish. Minwa nasewen the air. Nebe the water. Everything is being is being destroyed because of of us of the people not following the natural laws of the land, the natural code on how to live here. You know, and that's that's something I really want to talk about as we continue our our thing today, this thing, um, and. You know, there is a movement of our people trying to reclaim who we are as Anishinaabek people, as Indigenous people. You know, and that's a very beautiful thing. Abdek Wibiskabing Anishinaabe Atswa Nikia. You know, we're we're gonna pick up what the our our way of life. We're going to start going back to the land and taking back our, our Anishinaabe Atsuan, our way of life. And this is really important because right now we're in a time of climate change. We're in a time of, of an ecological collapse. And I always think, how do we get through something like this? You know, how do we get through something that it seems so big? And when we seem so powerless. And so I always go back to our creation stories. I go back to the stories of our people. Because in those stories, it's coded on how we're supposed to live here on earth. And those stories, they remind us that we have gifts. Like real gifts that we have. True gifts. And I want to talk about that. You know, they say a long time ago, you know, be before we, we come to this earth, we come from a place called Ishpeming in the stars, way over there in, in the West. That, that that's, we have a home there, that that's, that's our real home. And that the earth was provided as a, as a gift by the spirits, by the six powers of the universe. And that we're invited to this, this earth, this sacred lodge here on earth as a gift. And so, of course, we, we start making our way to this earth once we're offered this gift. They say we choose our parents, who our parents are going to be. And we start going towards earth through the stars. But we go through four powers. And those, through, those four sacred powers teach us about how to live here. The first power that we go through is a very powerful power, and it's the power of Shkode, the power of fire. And during that time, we learn all about the, the power of, of fire, the power of the sun, the power of Wabano, the great power that that brings light and keeps us that will keep us alive here on earth the second power that we go through is nasewen the air and as we go through that power of air we begin to understand the breath of life and that it's our it's our heart the breath of life is our songs it's our words. It's what we give out to the world. Our voice. Our who we are. Then we continue through those a, a, another power. And they say that this this power is very sacred to us. We we go through the power of nebe water. And that that when we're in our mom's bellies, 
we're being taught about life. We're being taught about the sacredness of water and how water connects everything. And of course, the last power that we learn before we come to this earth is the power of the sacred hoop, that we're all connected, that we're all connected in this, in this spiritual way. And that through as we go through that sacred hoop, we learn that when we come to this earth, that we're just a part of everything. And when we come to this earth, we take a deep breath of that, of that air and we sound our voice off to the world. And we cast medicine far. That baby's first cry is not, is not a cry. That baby's first voice as it gets sent across the, the world is casting medicine everywhere. And then of course we're born into this sacred lodge here on earth. And that this is a very sacred gift. This is a very beautiful sacred gift that we have here. And that this isn't really our home. But there's many spirits that live here. There's many things that live here on this earth. This is their home. And we're guests. Because we come from Kaning, we come from the stars, the land of the stars, and Ishpeming. But as guests here, we respect that Chinak Nagewaninan. We respect the natural laws of this earth. And we respect the, the the nations that live here already. And as guests, we follow the sacred code on how to live here. And this, this code or this these ancient teachings that have been passed down from generation to generation since our creation remind us of how to live here as good guests, to be respectful, to be kind, and to make sure that we're not ruining somebody's home. As a child, I remember hearing stories about all these things that live here. Of course, I grew up in the bush and we had, uh, you know, canoes. That's how we traveled all the time. I spent most of my life with a canoe tied to my back. And of course, we'd travel, we'd fish, we'd hunt, we'd go live. And I remember a long time ago, they'd say, oh, the Mimigwesiwak, they live over there at that cliff. We'll go, we'll go by there, we'll make some offerings there. And so we would, we'd stop by, we'd leave some things there for them. And then they'd say, oh, the, the Pahi suck live over there by that, that river. So of course we'd leave offerings there for them too. Then they would say the Bagu Janiniwak, they live over there in those, in those cliffs, in those caves. Oh, we'd leave some offerings there too. Oh, we'd be traveling around and they'd say, oh, you know, a long time ago, the Manabe Kwayak, the mermaids, they were seen on that rock there. They live underneath there in a cavern. We better go leave some offerings there. And then they'd say, oh, you know, on top of that mountain, Nimki Beneshiwak, they lived there, Thunderbirds. So we'd leave our offerings there. And we'd keep traveling and we'd keep traveling. They'd say, oh, you know, over here, there's a tunnel that goes underneath the ground. Chigenebegok, there's serpents that live in there. We'll leave our offerings there too. So as a young child, I knew that there's, there's things that live here. This is their home. As Anishinaabek people, we're just visitors. And that one day we'll go back to Ishpeming. We'll go back up to the stars. But while we're here, we have to respect the home of these amazing, beautiful spirits that live here. And that this earth is a spirit world too. 
and that we have to respect the sacred lodge of these beings that live here. Of course, the Dimimigwesiwak, the Pahisak, the Bhagavajaniniwak, those are all little people, types of little people. They have their own gifts. And I remember as a young person, as we were traveling, they'd always say, you know, there's a spot here. And they call this in Sagamagaming. And, and there's a, an old serpent that lives here. It's white. And it's old. And it has a tunnel that goes down. And this tunnel comes up at a place called Mujgad Mong Singh. And then that tunnel goes down again. It comes up at a place called Kop Kik Mik Singh. Then this tunnel goes down and it travels all the way to a place called Mindegwea Sin. Then the tunnel goes down. It comes up at a place called Ginebeguk Jibigajwat. Then the tunnel goes down and it comes up at a place called Ginebek Shing. So in my mind, I knew that there was things underneath the ground, that there is great powers underneath the ground. Then the tunnel would would go to this island called Shkodeying. And then it would go to a place called a Sinkik. And then it would go to Bodashkaying. And then from Bodashkaying, it would go all the way to Kwikwigzhuang. From Kwikwigzhuang, it would go to a Siniswasaning. From a Siniswasaning, it would come up at a place called Matigogzibing. From there, it'd go to another place called Kwegwe Zhuang. And then it would come up at a place called Mitig Mish Wikwimkong. And then it would go to another place called Ajdab Kissening. So in my mind, we were told of this elaborate tunnel system. And we were taught these places because we knew that that's where those under underwater beings lived the powers of the underworld that's where they have their homes and so we would make these little offerings called zenababa tigu and suck ribbons and little sticks and we'd make our offerings for the water spirits and there we were always told that we weren't allowed to dig into the ground because we'd interfere with that power that's there. That those serpents, they, they lay their eggs in the ground. And that if we were to bust one of those eggs, and if that yolk was to come up onto the earth, it could destroy everything, it's so powerful. And that there's a reason why the serpents are in the ground and that the thunderbirds in this, are in the sky. And between the battles that they have, that's what creates all of the natural law. And that we're just a part of that. And so as a young person, I was put to fast on those places. All of those places I told you are sacred sites. All of those places that I told you have something called Masinabiyaganan. They have pictographs. Because our people would go there and fast during times of war and famine and sickness, trying to get the medicine to help their people get through whatever was happening. And of course, they would paint the pictures using ottoman of paint to record what has, ha what has happened. And sometimes it was the Manadowak themselves, the spirits that would paint those pictures to let us know what happened. And so, of course, I studied these pictures because that's part of my name. Which means the man who, who draws on the rocks or paints the rocks. So it was my life path to understand uh, the sacred sites in these pictures. So I never went to school after I was 10 years old. And I set on a quest 
to learn about these symbols and these stories and these these pictographs and these sacred sites and all of these things. But it wasn't uh, like learning through them through school. It was learning through them through fasting on these sites and the ceremonies that go with it and learning the, the oral stories about them. And they say, if you want to get educated, that's where you go get educated. You have to go sit on those places to go learn something. And I, I felt very uh, blessed not to be able to go to school. <laughs> I felt pretty blessed that I couldn't, uh, didn't have to go. Um, and so that's, that's how I, that's how I grew up understanding like that. And so I always believed that as Anishinaabek people, that we have responsibilities here, that we don't have rights, that we have responsibilities. And that our responsibilities are to make sure that this earth is less, left the same way we found it. That's our responsibility. That's part of the gift that we carry from our creation stories. That's part of the, the beautiful um, spiritual gift that we have as Anishinaabe, is our connection to the lands and waters. And so... You know, I often think about that today because we have stories about when our people were lost and were brought back to the original instructions. We were brought back to that original path on how to live here on this earth. And as Anishinaabek people, we have had many trials and tribulations over the, over the past, in the past. And so I love it when these stories are told because they remind us of who we really are and what we really have to do. And, you know, I think that in today's world, you know, we're suffering a massive ecological collapse. We're in climate change. And so I often ask our people, you know, who are you? You know, like, I mean, who are you really? What's your gift? What's your true path here on this earth? What's your medicine? Who are you? Because whoever that is, that's who we need. Of course, the society wants us to conform and they want us to melt into the Canadian melting pot. They want us to be like everybody else. But we can't, we can't do that. We have to be who we are. We have to pick up what is ours? In Kapska Bay and Dapna Nan Enwaying, we have to start picking up our sound. Meanwhile, Gaunitoying. Gin win man pi and jibayan. Gin win man pi. You know, we have to to be who we really are. Anishnabek kinagada men. We are Anishnabek. That, that's who we are. You know, when I think about that, you know, Enjibayan, I think about our, our purpose. And there's a story that I want to tell about how we got medicine here. This earth is sprinkled with medicine. This earth is scattered with medicine, with mshkeke. Our word for medicine, mshke, is strong. Ke is earth. Strong earth. That's our word for medicine. And it's all over this, all over our lands, all, all in our waters. And I'll tell you a story about how, how that came to be. They say long time ago, long time ago, there was two sisters. They were on the moon. And that's where they come from. They say there's a, a crack in the moon. They call that crack 
Das gab gak. In that crack, it opens up, and this family that lives inside there, they come out and they play on the moon, and they go back inside in their home. But these two sisters that lived inside there came out one time to play, and the one sister found something, a bone. They call that bone magoons. It's like a bone all. And she really liked it. It was a sharp, skinny bone, and she put that in her hair, made a bun. And she, of course, really enjoyed it. But the other sister started to get kind of jealous about it and said, I want that too. And the sister said, well, you have to dig around and find your own. So the sister started to dig around all over the moon. That's why those craters are up there. That was from her digging around. That's why those pits are in, in the moon. That was from her digging around trying to find a bone, but she couldn't find one. She couldn't find a bone. And so she got a, she got more jealous of her sister. Next thing you know, they started fighting. And she got thrown off the moon. And she started twirling down to earth, mad. And she landed in the water. And she sunk to the bottom. But when she landed on the water, her medicine bag opened up. Her medicine bag opened wide open and all of her, her medicine started to sink to the bottom of the waters. And it was dark down there, very dark. And she sat there and she pouted at the bottom of the water. But there was something watching her from a distance. It was an old bear. And that old bear, get to Makwa. That old bear was watching and seeing what happened. Watch her fall from the moon and land in the water. So that bear jumped in the water and swam to where she was on top and started to call down to her and said, there's, there's monsters down there. They're going to eat you if you don't come up here. There's big snakes. There's big things there. And of course she says, okay, I'll come up, but my medicine is here. And that bear said, don't worry, I'm a bear. I know all the medicines here. I know every root and shrub. I can teach you and, and help you fill up your medicine bag again. So she, sw she swam to the top. She swam to the top of that, that water and she jumped on that old bear's back. And the bear took her to the shoreline. And once they got to the shoreline, they made a wigwam. And she went into the forest and she brought him a bunch of berries. And said, I'll give you this as an offering if you teach me about medicines here so I can fill up my medicine bag. All my star medicine got is gone. The bear said, no problem. For seven years, that bear taught her about medicines of this earth. For seven years, that bear taught her all the roots and shrubs. And after seven years, she became a, a young woman. And she was so in love with that, that bear. Like every time she looked at that bear, she had hearts in her eyes. And she says, you know, my medicine bag is only half full, but I want you to be my husband. That bear said, that's never going to happen in a million years. Smarten up. Get a hold of yourself. And she said, well, can you at least teach me about these other medicines? I need to fill my medicine bag right up. And the bear said, I'll think about it. 
and said, I did tell you I was going to fill your medicine bag up. So let's, let's keep going. So for another seven years, she learned all those medicines and her medicine bag was filled up. By then she was madly in love with that bear. And she kept picking on that bear all the time. I want you to be my husband. I want you to be my husband. There's no, there's nobody else that I want now. And that bear said, well, okay, I'll be your husband. I'll be your husband. Only because I'm lonely. And she says, you're not lonely. You're in love with me. And the bear said, yes, I'm in love with you too. And they, and they became a husband and wife. And that bear told her, always be careful of what's in the water. That's what the bear told her. Pretty soon they, they had a, a little baby. That baby's name was Winona. That was the baby's name. And they, they raised her up. Good. They put her out to fast. They taught her medicines. She knew about all of the, the spirits here. They raised her really good. And it was time for her to go look for a husband if she wanted to. And she wanted to. But they told her, whatever you do, don't marry the west wind. West wind's bad. So what does she do? She marries the West Wind. And of course, trouble happened. The parents didn't like it, but that's the way it was. The West Wind would come into her life and sweep out of her life and come and go. And she was often left alone. And finally, she got pregnant. But her stomach was big. And you could hear thunder inside of her stomach. It was always crashing around inside of her stomach. So finally it was time for her to have her, her baby. And she held on to a tree. And she started praying. And she started pushing. And all of a sudden, a baby came out. This baby was like a regular baby, a human baby. But when it came out, it started running right away. And it ran into the forest. They couldn't catch it. And it disappeared. The next baby that she had, she was going to have two babies. She gave birth to a baby that was half rabbit. And half Nishnabe, half human. And that, that baby too took off fast. Her stomach was hurting. She says, I'm going to have another baby. She's going to have triplets. All of a sudden, this white rabbit came out. So, of course, Winona's mom grabbed that, that rabbit and put it in a wigwam and put a bowl over top of it so it couldn't run away. Finally, Winona said, I'm going to have another baby. She was going to have four of them. And out came a big brown stone, sharp. And that stone came out and hit the ground, thump. Winona fell over right there and she died. And that stone, it started to roll all by itself. And it rolled off into the forest. Of course, now, Star Woman, the grandmother, had to look after those grand, that grandchild, that rabbit. And they call that that grandma Nukmas. And 
She went to that wigwam. She lifted up that bowl, but it wasn't a rabbit anymore. It was a squirrel. So she put the bowl down. And then she lifted it up, and then it was a frog. Then it was a snake. Then it was a bat. Then it was a fish. Then this thing was a plant. So she put the bowl back on it and thought, this is a very powerful baby. And then she lifted it up again. It was a white rabbit. And of course, she named that baby Nanabujo. Or other people will say Nanabush. And that was the birth of Nanabush. And so they raised Nanabujo, the grandparents, the old bear, and, and Nukomis, they raised Nanabujo and said, don't go near the water. The serpents don't like our family. Don't go near the water, whatever you do. Well, when Nanabujo got older, he started to feel like he needed to find his brother, that stone, the one that took the life of his mom. And he wanted to fight his brother because his mom died. And so when he was a teenager, he left. And his grandparent says, don't go look, don't go look for trouble. Because you're always trying to get into trouble all the time. But he couldn't help it. Off he went. It was in the winter time. And he was traveling and he seen these wolves on the lake, just little black dots running across the shoreline on this lake, a frozen lake. So he ran over there and joined them. And the chief of those wolves said, what do you want here? I want to hunt with you. And the wolf said, well, we can hunt with us if you can keep up. And so Nana Buju spent the winter hunting with those wolves. Finally, it was springtime. And the chief went up to Nana Buju and said, why are you really here? Nana Buju said, I want to see if I can find my brother, the stone. I want to fight him. And the chief said, you know, many years ago, a brown stone came rolling into our village. And it sat with us for a long time. It sat for us for a very long time. And as that stone got older, it turned black. And, you know, you've been hunting with that stone all winter, your hunting partner. And Nanabuja said, what do you mean? Well, it turned itself into a wolf because it has powers. You've been hunting with your brother all winter. Nana Buju at that time had a change of heart and didn't want to fight his brother, but knew his brother was a, was a good wolf, a good brother. And Nana Buju said, well, it's our time to go. And his brother, the wolf, said, I'll go with you. And they took off and they left. Nana Buju was so excited, the water was starting to break up. But Nana Buju forgot to tell his brother the wolf, don't go near the water. Just to get only go there to get a drink and quickly leave. Because those serpents don't like us. He forgot to tell his brother that. And his brother went to the water to drink. Splash! A big serpent came and got that wolf, drug it back down into that tunnel. And that was it for Nana Buju's brother. Nana Buju was so mad. So mad. And so he knew that he had to fight the serpents. And so he got his bow and arrows ready. And he, 
He's seen a whole bunch of serpents on a beach basking in the sun, and he killed them all. And then he'd dive down into that tunnel, and then he would shoot those serpents and get away. Those serpents were so mad at him. So what they did was they got this frog, Maki, this old lady frog. They said, we're going to put some medicine on your tongue, those serpents told her. And we want you to sneak up to Nanabuju. And we want you to, to lick that, lick him with your tongue and that'll kill him with that medicine. Sneak up to him and kill him for us. We'll give you a lot of gifts. So that old frog agreed, started hopping along the trail. Nanabuju said, Ani! Buju! Anisha is Nikajian. What's your name? Oh, I don't even have a name. I'm just Maki. I was so pitiful, I never got a name. Nanabuja said, What are you doing? How come you're hopping towards me? Oh, I, I'm so lonely. I'm so pitiful and lonely. Nanabuju thought, are you trying to kill me? Are you somebody that wants to hurt me? That frog said, I'm a frog. You're the mighty powerful Nanabuju. I could never hurt you. So Nanabuju sat down and that frog started hopping towards him. Nanabuju just looked away for a second. All of a sudden that frog opened its mouth and that tongue shot out at him. Nanabuju just just turned away and that tongue just missed his face. And as the tongue was going back, Nanabuju grabbed one of his arrows and threw it at that frog and killed it. That frog almost killed him. So Nanabuju thought, oh my goodness, those serpents are now they're they're trying to hire people to kill me. So Nanabuju says, I know what I'm going to do. And he opened up that frog's mouth and he jumped inside that frog and became that frog. Nanabuju hopped to the lake and jumped into the lake and started going down to where that tunnel was, where those serpents lived. And Nanabuju pretended to be that frog. And Nanabuji went down there to the boss in Sagama and said, you know, I did it. I killed Nanabuju. And Sagama said, are you sure? I'm absolutely sure. And that serpents all started to get excited. They all started moving around, dancing around. Next thing you know, they formed this great big ball. And they were all singing, and this big ball was just rolling around the bottom of the lake. They were so happy Nanabuju was dead. And of course, that frog was Nanabuju. And as this big ball was rolling, they were just like in a frenzy. Nanabuju started to lick that ball of serpents. And every time it licked one of them, they died. That ball started to get smaller and smaller. Nanabuju just kept licking that ball of snakes as it was rolling around. Finally, Insagama said, something's wrong here. He said that that frog, all of a sudden Nanabuju turned back into his normal self, grabbed his bow and arrows and started to attack the rest of those serpents. And they barely escaped. There was very few survivors. Nanabuju swam to the top and started to sing his victory songs on the edge of the shoreline. The serpents that survived were so mad. They were so mad. So they had a sacred council meeting. They had a very sacred meeting. And what they agreed to do was to flood the earth. 
using their magic powers. And those serpents, they start to sing their songs. And of course, the waters start to rise and rise and rise. Nanabuju didn't know what to do. So he started climbing the top of the hills. The water kept rising, so he'd, he'd go climb on the mountains. And the water kept rising. So he started to climb the trees on the mountains. And the water kept rising. And the serpents just kept singing their songs. Finally, Nana Buju was on the top, on the tallest tree on a mountain, and the water was coming up and got to his mouth. And Nana Buju started to sing his song, and the tree would grow, and then the water would come up. And finally, the water would get up to his mouth again, and he would sing his song again. This time, the tree would shoot up, but not as far as before. Certainly that water was coming. The serpents kept singing their songs, making that water rise. Finally that water got to his mouth again. He sang a song. This time the tree only went up a little bit. And finally that water came up. Nanabuju sang another song. And the tree just grew a little bit, but the water stopped moving. The serpents thought for sure that Nanabuju Buju was dead. So Nana Buju was sitting there floating on a log. And there was lots of animals that were floating around. Lots of things were floating around on logs and everything. So Nana Buju started to call the animals together. And said, we have to move quick. We have to move quick. And of course, Nana Buju at that time said, what we need is a piece of earth. If I can get a piece of earth, I can make land. But I need, I, I can't go down there. Those serpents will kill me. We need some volunteers to go down. So right away, Crane said, I'll volunteer. Crane dove down, trying to get some earth, but it was too deep. It came up right away. Otter said, I'll try. Otter went down. Couldn't make it. It came back up. Nanabuju said, we have to keep trying. All of a sudden, a beaver went down came up but couldn't it couldn't get any any dirt to make the world. Jajak, the crane, you know, said I tried my best, but I didn't give anything for my for my dive. Nagig the otter said the same thing. That's true, I didn't give anything either. Mick the beaver said, I didn't give anything either. So all, all of a sudden, Muskrat came and said, I'll, I'll try. And Muskrat says, I'll give something. And of course, it had a little bit of roots that it was saving for food. And it offered those roots to the spirits and said, let me try. And that muskrat dove down and it was gone for a long time, a very long time. All of a sudden, Nana Buju was very wondering if that thing was alive. All of a sudden, they seen bubbles. It came up. Nana Buju quickly grabbed that muskrat. But guess what? It passed away, coming up. It almost made it, but it didn't, it didn't survive. But Nana Buju opened up that little muskrat hand and inside that hand was some earth. So Nana Buju grabbed that, that earth 
and blew it. All of a sudden, land started to be created. And all of a sudden, the earth started, as we know it, started to be created. So Nana Buju got all the animals together and said, let's start making things how we want it. So all the animals helped Nana Buju make, make everything. The rivers, the, the rocks, everything, how things look like. They all played a part in helping, helping how this, this world looks like. But there is one animal that felt kind of slighted a little bit. Miknak, it was the turtle. Nanabuji said, turtle, you're awfully quiet. How come you're so quiet? Because you never asked me to do anything. Nanabuji said, well, it's not that I didn't want you to do anything. I just, I would just, I just didn't know. I'm, I'm, I got mixed up and clustered and, and it's not that I didn't want you to do anything. And that turtle said, oh, you don't, you don't even like me anyway. And turtle went down to the bottom of the lake and started pouting. So Nana Buju thought, you know, I should have asked turtle something. I have an idea. So Nana Buju called that turtle, said, hey, I have a job for you. And that turtle said, I don't want to go up there. I'm just going to dig myself in the mud in the bottom of this lake and I'm going to stay here. Nana Buju said, no, come up. I have an idea. You can, you can help create something beautiful. So that turtle thought, okay, I might as well. So it floated up to the top of the lake. As it got to the top of the lake, its back started to stick out. So Nana Buju grabbed his bow and arrow and he shot at that turtle, not to kill it, but just to startle it. That arrow just barely nicked the shell and it bounced off. And it startled the turtle. And that turtle's tail flipped up like this. And it created Jibai Mikan. It created the Milky Way. Something that we call the, the path of souls. Oh, turtle was so happy. Remember a long time ago when Nungo Kwe, when the star woman, Nukumis, when she fell in the waters and her medicine bag opened up and all that star medicine went to the bottom of the, of the waters. Well, it was still there. And when Turtle splashed at his tail, all that mud, all that medicine scattered across the sky and it created the Milky Way. And of course, at that time, the spirits were very, very happy. And six of them came down to the earth and they spoke to Nana Buju. And they said, you know, we're very proud of you. And you know, as you're making this earth, we're going to bring your brother, the wolf, back from the dead. And let him run for four days. As far as he can run for four days, that's how much earth you can have or you can make. So, of course, Nana Buju's brother came back. The black wolf. And that's how this, this world was made. And I think about that story often. I think about, you know, the sacredness of what's here. They say that there's something in the water. They call it manadusak, like little worms. And these little worms, what they do is they, they crawl around the water and they start storing that star medicine on their back. They start crawling around. They start putting that medicine on their back. They spend their lives doing that. Of course, that medicine 
on their back, it starts to collect. And when those, those little worms, when they pass away, their medicine bundles, they wash up on the shoreline. And that's our shells. That's why the shell is sacred. And so this here is wampum. They call it migas. Migas nabiganan. And it's a very sacred thing. And we know that our wampum carries a lot of our laws because it, it represents everything from the bottom, the deepest part of our lakes, all the way up to the stars and everything in between. It carries those laws. So our people would make belts out of these, beads out of these. Minadomanes, spirit beads. They know that they're sacred. And when, when, when they made their belts, like the Godot Naganana, the dish with one spoon, they were making a, an agreement that went to the depths of the lake all the way to the stars. And everything in between would witness the sacred agreement between those people that were a part of that treaty. So our wampum agreements are coded in natural law. They're to remind us of who we really are. They're to remind us that this place is magical, that there's medicine everywhere. They're to remind us that this place is filled with spirit, that we are in a spirit world here too. It's to remind us that we're in a sacred lodge and that we're visitors and guests. And that as we live our life here, we give offerings for everything. And I offer my tobacco. We always say that. We're always giving because this lodge always gives to us. The sacred lodge, it gives us shelter. It gives us food. It gives us everything we need. And we're able to have families on here. We're able to have love. We're able to have all these good things here in this lodge. And that's the gift that we've been given. A beautiful gift. And so our people wear shells all the time. Because us too come from the stars. And we recognize the sacred medicine that these shells have. I remember one time I was speaking to this old lady old medicine woman and her grandmother gave her two migas shells a different kind of shell we call this migas too but there's another another type of shell that's called migas and they her grandmother gave her two medicine shells migas shells and she put them in a jar and she was a teenager when she got those shells And all of a sudden, you know, many years later, she, she thought she'd go check up on those shells. That whole jar was filled with mega shells. Those two shells was start to have babies. And those, they had a lot of babies and they had a big family. And they all lived in that jar. So she she was amazed. She took out those shells and she made her, her dress with them. And that's how she, be, she got her power. And she became a very powerful medicine woman. And that's, that's what happened. And so I just wanted to share that with you. That we're in a very sacred time. That we're in something called Atsukan. 
What I just told you is Atsukan. Atsukan to Bijabon, the sacred story. Well, guess what? We're in a sacred story now. The two legged are on a quest to destroy the earth, they lost their way. Everything is being destroyed right now. And in a thousand years, they're going to look back at this time in history and they're going to tell this story. They're going to tell this Atsukan of when the two, two legged tried to destroy everything. And guess who the characters of that story is going to be? It's going to be us. We're the ones that they're going to be talking about. And so who are you? Who are you really? Because we need the real you at this time. You know, I believe that when we put our medicines together, when we sing our songs, when we go back to original instruction, When we lift our people up, when we start bringing back our languages, when we start bringing back our lodges, our ceremonies, when we start fasting and doing our spiritual traditions, when we start educating our kids on those, on those cliffs, fasting, that we will survive because that's what I was told. I remember just the other, the other day, I was off to go see this old man, his name was Kajajwan, a very spiritual old man. And he told me this, he said, you know, a long time ago, he said, there were six spirits in the sky he says they lived in the, the moon and that there's a doorway there. And they came out and they started to open their medicine bags and started scattering medicine all over the earth to help the Anishinaabe people. And he said today, our, the two-legged are not respecting that medicine and they're destroying it. He says, and the animals are causing sickness. He says, so go in the bush. Go in the bush. Go find your power. Go find out who you are. Because the world needs that. Your people need that. Don't get fooled by anything else. We're in a sacred time. We're in Atsukan. I said, oh, that's a big order, but I'll, I'll do what I can. Uh, thank you very much, Kajajwan. Um, but that's what I believe. Because that's what I was told. These old people would not lie to me. That old man is so close to spirit. He doesn't know how to lie. He couldn't lie even if he wanted to. He's like a baby. And so I wanted to share that with you. I don't know how much time we have, but just remember, I'll take some questions, but just remember that, you know, we have an opportunity. We have a, a beautiful opportunity for change. Let's keep building our people up. Let's keep supporting every, every good move forward. And the spectrum of change, it's huge. Not everybody's gonna think like, like you or me, but as long as we're moving in the same direction, that's what counts. Don't work in silos, build, build. Build your bridges, your lodges, your friendships. Adopt. Go into the forest and adopt everything. 
go into the where the people are make relatives keep building keep building something sacred and and we will be okay you know believe in your people lift your people up and that's that's what i'd just like to say for now thank you miigwech that was such a pleasure and privilege to have an opportunity to sit and that sentiment was echoed by many many people in the chat today uh, we have 300 participants roughly who have joined today from all over turtle island um, just so you're aware that there is a lot. I do have a number of questions that people have posed if I could just maybe get started. Um, one in particular, um, one person had asked, what is the medicine of the serpent? Okay, so the medicine of the serpent is, it's the power of the underground. And they're very, very powerful. And we're always told not to dig in the ground, only to bury our dead. And during the treaty, uh, the treaties, we told the settlers not to dig deeper than the depth of a, an ax head or a hand or a plow because we didn't want to disturb the underground. And so their power is, is very, very, very important for the natural laws of this earth. And it's through the, 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 the struggles that the thunderbirds and the serpents have that really provide balance so that we can live here on earth. The serpents are very, very powerful. And when people go to dig up their power and bring it up to the earth, it's destroying the earth because it's too powerful for us. It's not supposed to be up here. It belongs down there. That's why we have to keep it in the ground. We can't dig in the ground and bother that stuff in there. That's a sacred thing. That was even, uh, that was expressed uh, during our, our Chinook Nagei Winina Anin. That was explained in our treaties. But that's, that's the power. Good question. Thank you. This is a question from Emily. Emily. Um, she said, my spirit name is Little Beaver. How would you say that in Ojibwe? Um, Little Beaver is a uh, or sorry, Mekons. So Mekons. Mekons. Good, Good question. Aaron Bottle wrote it as well. Thank you. Um, another question. What is the literal meaning of Nanabojo? Um, is it white rabbit or is it derived from that? No, it doesn't mean white rabbit. It, it's a uh, Nanabojo, from what I understand, the name means um, it, part of it comes from from the word rabbit. Boge. Boge is rabbit. Nena means like uh, um, like we got a we got a, a break. We got something, we got a good deal, sort of thing. We could relax because Nana Buju is here. That's what the it's hard, you can't explain it in English. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, someone had a question about the camp that you had referenced at the beginning. Um, and they wondered if where the camp was and what kind of workshops might be coming up. Yeah, well, we went to, uh, when I was uh, five years old, I was taken away by Indian agents. Um, and our lands were stripped of indigenous people and we were forced onto the reserves where, where we were apprehended by Indian agents so that we could be colonized. And, uh, and so when I got older, I, of course, I was 10 years old when I, when I came back, I always, the elders always said that we need to go back to the land. 
And so I went back up north, north of the reserve, back in our traditional territory. And we started to take our land back and we started to build a camp uh, in the forest for the re revitalization of our language, our culture, our history, our medicines, our land-based education, our all of that stuff, our symbolisms. And uh, so now we have seven houses here and we're building a, a language a learning center. And uh, we started to, to, and it's almost done. Um, I negotiated with the, the government, um, basically saying that uh, we're Anishinaabek, we're allowed to be here, and that we have an inherent responsibilities here that go back since our creation, and that uh, and that you have to respect that. And so there was a lot of uh, confrontation in the beginning. There was a lot of this and that happening, uh, but uh, they they choose to to leave us alone. Um, I pretty much told them, if you want to go to court, you will lose because uh, there's absolutely no evidence anywhere written where we surrendered the right to not live in our territories. And, and, and if you want to do that, let's do that. But if not, then, then see you later. They never, ever came back. Mm -hmm. And so we took land back and we started building this, this village where we have elders and young people that live here all for the revitalization of Anishinaabe and our way of life. So it's pretty cool. Very good. I've seen some photos uh, on social media. <laughs> um, I just wondered if you're aware that your camera is off. I didn't know if you turned it off intentionally or not. Oh, geez. Okay. I'll turn it back on. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, I didn't know if you were having connectivity issues or not. Um, so we have a, a question. Uh, earlier in your talk, you uh, spoke of the little people. Um, and Reba had asked if you could spell out the name for uh, of the little people and, and they would like to hear more about them if you have a could speak to that. Um, well, where I come from, I mean, linguistically, everywhere you go, different nations are going to have different names for little people and different stories about them. Um, but little people, um, there's stories about little people all over the earth. So when I studied little people uh, from Africa, um, they have similar stories in Ireland, similar stories in uh, Australia. So, I mean, little people are very common all over the earth. And they're a natural part of this earth. They're the, or the original inhabitants, I guess, of this earth. This is really their home. And... Uh, one of the little people that we have is called Bagwa Janini, Bagwa Janiniwak. I'll type it. I'm so bad with computers. And that interprets to uh, wild people. And uh, we have many stories about uh, about the Bhagavad Janiniwak. Lots of stories. Then we have the Mimigwesiwak. You know, like a butterfly is called Mimeguance because it's it's born in a cocoon. It transforms and it's covered in that cocoon and it's covered. So Mimeguance means that this little person is covered by stone because that's where they live. And the Mimeguaceiwak is a very powerful little person as well. The Bhagajaniniwak, they're like little people, like little kids. That's what they are, like little children. Mm. The Siwak are about three and a half feet tall. Yeah, they're full of hair. And uh, when you go, when you find pic 
pictograph sites, um, those are often either serpent sites or memeguesiwak sites. And so they live inside these caves. And when you go inside there, you find all sorts of roots and shrubs and medicines and all sorts of things there. And so they're very powerful. So our people would go fast at these memeguesiwak sites uh, to gain knowledge from them. And the rocks would open up and people would go in there. And they would see stone, stone tables or stone stairwells going down. They would see, um, like they'd have stone canoes and they could, uh, they, they really helped us out during times of war too. Mm -hmm. same, same with the serpents. So the Mimigwesiwak is a very powerful being. Then you have Pahi Sak. Pahi, Pahi. which is just little person and they're small and they're only about this big and they live in trees, tree stumps and little, little grass wigwams. They live around rivers and things like that. And again, they're very, they're very gifted. They're gifted with arrows and that we've actually uh, employed them during times of war to assist us in battle. Um, very gifted little people. There's lots of stories about them. So for where I come from, there's different kinds and uh, not all of them are tricksters and some of them can be quite grumpy. So we're very careful as to how we act around little people and which ones and things like that. Um, but again, all of them have been, in, have been in the aid of the Anishinaabek people. I mean, at the same time, we don't cross them either. We respect them. We also know that this is their home and that this is their, their world that we're just guests here so we always give them gifts always to give thanks for for sharing their their lodge with us good question great thank you um we had a question from kevin wondering if you could speak on the way we see the world in anishinaabe moen versus in english well even when you look at the word school you know kinamage You know, Kinamage Gamik is school. That's the word for school in the English language we say, Kinamagemik. And but if you're translating that word, you know, K is earth. Ma ge. It's like we're being shown. Kinamage Kinamage when the way of you know, gamak, it's like a beaver house. So it, it, it means that we're being shown the way of the earth in a sacred lodge. This world is a sacred lodge and that we're learning from the earth. So the language tells us, it teaches us that, that we're actually a part of something that's very sacred and beautiful here. And so that would be an example of, of a different worldview through the language. So I don't hear just school when I hear kinamage. I hear something different. I hear something different. So that's 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 really good. Thank you. Uh, question um, from Lori. Could you please speak about sufficiency? And then she's put an example. Um, or he, I'm not sure. I am not enough for the current challenge. I hear from so many people who report they they are not enough for the current critical. Um, so the question is, how do we show up now in a time of great uncertainty? I've heard this question from so many change agents and protectors who we need now more than ever. There's a few I don't questions. I don't know. The, the question is too complicated for me. Can you simple, make it more simpler? Sure. Okay, so <laughs> could you speak about sufficiency when you hear people say out loud, or what is they, I'm not enough what for does the that mean? challenge? Sufficiency, I don't even know what that means. So um, people who might feel that they don't feel they are good enough or they're not enough. And you had no. asked the question to connect to who we are and we bring gifts forward. And so how do we, maybe the question could be, how do we use our gifts um, that we all have and feel confident in bringing those forward? You know, I remember when I was younger, I felt like, um, 
I, I wasn't good enough because of society, because of the Indian agents, because of all these things. They made me believe that I wasn't good enough. You know, I come from the generation where we were told we were no good for nothing, drunken, lazy, bum Indians all time. And so that was kind of lingering on. Like, is it really true? Like, like I remember one time I was telling people I was Mexican because Me Mexican people had a higher status and where I come from than uh, natives. Mm -hmm. So I was telling people I was Mexican and I got caught. My grandpa caught me saying, why are you telling people you're Mexican for? You're not Mexican, you're Anishinaabe. Mm -hmm. Why are you, why are you doing that? I said, I don't know. I said, because I don't have nothing. He said, you're not supposed to have anything. That's what makes us rich. He goes, we have our culture, we have our language, we have our ceremonies. We have all these things that make us rich. Material things don't make us rich. He says, here's what I want you to do. He says, early in the morning when the sun comes up, he goes, I want you to, to face the sun. When that sun comes up, he says, I want you to look behind you and look at your shadow. Turn around to your shadow and, and put some tobacco on your shadow. Feast your spirit. Feast who you are as Nishnabe. <clears throat> Nourish it with tobacco. And be proud of who you are, because you're Anishinaabe. So that's what I did. I put tobacco on my shadow. So even today when I'm having a hard time, I put tobacco on my shadow to nourish my spirit, to nourish who I am, so that my gifts can be strong. And that's something a lot of people don't realize, is that we're made up of three parts our body, our, our spirit, and our shadow. Mm. So when you feast your shadow, you become stronger. Try it. It'll be good. Oh, miigwech. Good yeah, question. Thank you. We have a group of students in a grade five, six class. And so we have a few questions from these young people. I'll just tell you all three and then you can um, decide how you want to answer them. Uh, one is, why is it called Turtle Island? The second question is, when was the story made or maybe when was the story told? And how do we know we come from the stars? So that's from a grade six class joining us today. Um, we call it Turtle Island because they believe that um, a long time ago, they, uh, they, when you open up a turtle, when, when inside of a turtle, you'll find lots of things inside of a turtle. And that inside that turtle, it's like a lodge. And so inside the turtle, there's many things that live there under, inside. And so they, they believe that the belly, that this earth has a belly. And that on top of the turtle, that's where we live. And that that's why they call it Turtle Island. And that it's a very sacred thing. Um, the next question was the story. Yes. The story was passed. The story was passed down uh, orally through generations through generations. There's pictographs that are eight, eight, nine thousand years old that tell that story. The oral history on that is still the same. And so oral history is by far the most accurate way to transfer information. It's, it's the internet will never ever, a book, the internet will never ever beat oral history and the accurate um, transmission of, of information from one generation to the next. Um, and what was the last question? How do we know we How came we know? from the stars? Well, it's actually, um, Traditional knowledge is validating science all the time, modern science. When you look at modern science, if you look at the timeline, you know, we're over here now and today, 2021, this is when we started. And modern science is just a little baby. 
it's just right over here. But traditional knowledge goes all the way back thousands and thousands of years. So it's through our traditional knowledge, our stories, our ceremonies. It's through our connection with the spirits and the, the beings that live here that remind us that that's where we, that's where we come from. Good question. Great, thank you. And that, you know what, actually science, modern science, I actually work with NASA oh. uh, with some projects and uh, they, uh, they drill me with, with celestial stories and stuff like that sometimes. Um, but they, there's actual scientific proof that, that when a, when a star explodes, the very same uh, minerals and compounds that are in a star is actually in our bodies, the exact same ones. Hmm. And so even organically, like we actually do really come from a star or stars. Um, we have the exact same everything in our bodies, which is kind of interesting. And I mean, exactly, no more, no less, exactly, which is really neat. Good question. Wonderful. We have another um, student from a grade six, seven class in Treaty 4 territory. And the question is, what happened to the other sister from the moon? She's still up there. And there's other, there's other things up there. And so there's more stories about the moon. But we believe, we believe that the moon is a very powerful spirit. And that it goes through uh, a rebirth all the time. And... Uh, that the, our bodies are connected to the cycle of the moon because our bodies are filled with water and the moon, of course, is, is, uh, is connected to the water. And so uh, when a new moon comes, we call it Ashke Agojin. That means the new Ashke. It comes from the word Ashke Bewis. Ashke means new, new helper. A go jin hanging in the sky. The new helper hanging in the sky is coming. And so the new moon, you know, the new moon starts and it starts to fill up. And then it goes back down again. And then all of a sudden it it replenishes and this this new helper comes along. So we have ceremonies called Ashke Go Jin, where we sing songs about this new helper in the sky, these uh, these cycles. And uh, they believe that the, these people live inside the moon and live on the moon. And that's, that's what we believe. Wonderful. Um, there is a statement here and then a question um, from Sophia. I was told by an Anishinaabe woman that there are lots of restrictions and protocols about talking to the little people. For example, we are not supposed to talk about them in winter. Um, could you speak to this? Um, well, I mean, I grew up in the bush and there's different, uh, wherever you go, different families and different uh, villages and people will have different, um, you know, uh, different ways of understanding things. Um, and so it's all true. So I always say that whenever you hear different stories or different te teachings, they're all true. They're all just part of a, the bigger puzzle. And that when you put all these puzzles together, it makes the bigger picture. And so I definitely say, follow your, um, your family's traditions and, and uh, the teachings that your family has, because that's really important. And everywhere you go, you'll find things are different, but it's all, it all makes the big, bigger puzzle. That's a, that's a, that's a good point to make. Thank you. Um, are there and what are the teachings of the Stone Clan? If you could share any. Well, the rock people, you know, are very powerful and the little people that live inside the rocks. And so it's a medicinal sacred medicine clan, you know, and, and we know that uh, the rocks have no eyes, no ears, no, no mouth, but they know everything and that they're very old and that they carry much knowledge. And so oftentimes we're told to go sit on a rock to gain knowledge. And that if we want to get educated, that's where we have to go. So good question. 
great, thank you. We have, um, so here's a question. For young indigenous people who are searching for their indigenous identity, I understand the significances of our oral tradition. What is your advice for our youth to search for their identity? I would say, that, you know, put down some tobacco, make a gift to the earth, you know, give the earth a present, you know, something nice and ask, ask for that, that guidance in that direction and then start reaching, reaching out to elders and see where it takes you. I think you'd be really surprised on how fast you would find, find out that identity. I think it would happen very, very quickly. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, your video is off again, just so you know. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah another... I'm having connectivity problems, but. Okay. We have one more question perhaps before we um, move to our elder. Um, this is a question from Tara. When you spoke of putting out an offering, you had mentioned ribbons and sticks. What type of stick from what type of tree or bush and what color ribbons and reason for the color? Yeah, we used to make water offerings. We still do to the water spirits. We call it Zen Ba Matigo and Suck, ribbons and little sticks. And uh, the, the water spirits like that. And we tie them up in a certain way and we place them in the water at a certain time of year. And it's to uh, it's our gift to them for sharing, for allowing them to share the waters with them and to be able to fish and to be able to live our life like that. It's also a way to show that when we make these gifts, what we do is we take a little piece of clothing from our children. We take a little piece off and we, we also tie that into the, the sticks so that uh, those water spirits know that offerings were made or that a payment was made on their behalf and to protect them during the, when they're around the water. And so we, we do that to, for protection and also to give thanks. It's, a, it, it's, it's done out of the utmost respect. And it's a, it's a very beautiful thing. And the, the sticks we use, um, just little sticks. So we, we carve out little willows. Oh. And uh, that, that's what we use. And we used to use uh, our ribbons. We would use leather, but we'd cut strips of leather and we'd paint them red with the ornament, with a red sacred paint made out of clay. And we'd use that sacred paint to paint our ribbons. Good question. Wonderful. I think I can squeeze one more in here. Um, this is a question that just uh, popped up. I hear a lot of talk about the world and people on earth being part of a great awakening. Do you believe that part of this awakening is the indigenous cultures reclaiming their knowledge and power? Well, I think inherently every human being on the earth has, uh, you know, blood memory and, you know, original instructions through their culture and through their history that runs inside of them. And I think everybody's connected in such a profound way. So for example, my body is made up of 75% water and 25% uh, maple syrup. And when I drink my water, I'll pee it out. It'll go into the watershed and, uh, you know, something will, uh, my water goes into the watershed and then the essence of who I am, because my body is made up of water becomes also becomes connected to something else like a family of squirrels. And so that family of squirrels will transform into a white pine tree, which will transform eventually into a thundercloud which will eventually transform into uh, somebody sitting in, you know, Europe somewhere, who will then become a, a, a platypus. So, I mean, there is a strong connection that we all have that's rooted not only with each other, but with the earth. And so inherently, I think people are, are trying to get back to that. And indigenous people are certainly, um, we're the squeaky wheel right now saying, hey, we need to, we need to get back to who we are as human beings and we need to, you know, we need to get it together. And so I think indigenous people play an important part at this time, 
But I think that my hope is that people will celebrate who they are and celebrate their diversity and rekindle their songs and their ceremonies and their, their connections to the land. And so just like a forest diversity, a very di diverse forest is a rich forest because it gives everything to everything. And so diversity with human beings is equally important for the revitalization of our ecosystems because all human beings are, are interconnected with, with the biology of the earth. And so I think that it's really important that, that we, uh, we, we also give space to, to those that, that are um, celebrating their diversity. When they sing their songs, we're being celebrated too. When we sing our songs, they're being celebrated. And so we really are one, we're connected. Good, good question. Wonderful. Well, you've certainly, gosh, I, I am glad. And I just wanna say that we really appreciate you giving us the opportunity today to record this. Um, because I find myself, I was making notes because it helps me remember things, but I feel like I just wanna sit and listen. And, and I think, you know, as these teachings are passed down through oral history, they're meant to be heard and, and heard and heard. And I know we can't be with you, you know, in person at this time, um, but we really appreciate you, you know, coming with us on Zoom today. And I am, my brain is just thinking of how we can continue this forward because there are so many interested people here today. You know, we had, I think at one point, almost 340 people um, and we can't all descend upon your, your home <laughs> to, to have that. And I, and I know we have, we're fortunate we have elders, you know, all around us and people that share those teachings, but it would really be great if we could, um, you know, continue this, this learning as a, as a group, um, because really we have been able to connect with people of all ages from all over. Um, I just want to thank you for your question that resonated with me was the, who are you really? Um, because, you know, we go about our day always. And so sometimes, you know, we just do what we do, but we don't always think about what our gifts perhaps are that help us be who we are with other people. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, I would like to uh, invite Elder Jean Nowagizik now to share closing prayer. Uh -huh. Thank you, Chibi Glitch. Uh, I just want to say to Isaac, thank you for your knowledge and wisdom. And uh, we do that back home here quite a bit, throwing these, these uh, six, six to the million dollar questions and, and answers of what Mishinabe and uh, what, what uh, is it interesting is the creation story, you know, me and my bro, we we share that same story, but just slightly, you know, from from our, our area here regarding the creation. It still talks about the stars and the moons and uh, and uh, and the some of the evidence that we we hear is that. Every now and then, the Anishinaabe person travels to the sky, you know, the near near death experiences. We, we hear those stories, you know, of life, life uh, out in the stars, eh? And uh, coming back to the earth, you know, where, where we come from. And that was interesting. What was interesting about the little people, you know, I, uh, I heard some of those old names about the little people, Meme Gwesok, and and, uh, and I spent some years up north in and working with the people up there, and they they talk about 
little spirit people, Chicha Konsak, you know, and uh, little little crane people, you know. So it was it was interesting to talk about that, and 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 you know, a lot of people um, today's day today is it's really hard to digest that kind of stuff, you know. So one other thing I've learned, you know, from, you know, why we drift away from our teachings and our culture, I think is because, you know, it was easier to go sit in the church and kneel down in a nice soft cushion and pray. I think that was the, you know, one of the simplest way I could explain that, you know, it was, you know our teachings and our ways sometimes you know you know trying to understand the elements around us the you know, mother earth those kinds of things and and i think we have lots of work ahead of us and uh i just like the the continuous uh, uh bringing those you know people back to discuss and talk about, you know, a lot of us, you know, simple-minded people will think that it's nonsense. It's not, this is real. These are stories that are passed on to me, you know? And sometimes we think it was a harsh environment. Yes, it was. That's the only way we survived by, by uh, you know, living by these laws, you know, by these teachings. And, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and the four elements of life, the fire, water, and the air, and, and the mishomas, you know. So we have to really, really say that when we put down tobacco, that it really means something, you know. It's, it's not a, you know, it's not a, just a, just an exercise of putting down a tobacco, you know. So I really, really um, uh, thank the the speaker Isaac, and 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 that uh, you you continue. You, you you're still a young man, you know. You you have lots of voice ahead of you. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, as new new. Uh, new breed of uh, educators uh, spring up, we, we will begin to uh, you know, easily, easily pick up our, an old man told me one time, you know, being Nishinaabe, you know, our way of life and who we are as Nishinaabe feel, it's in our, it's in our head. Our language is in our head, it's there. You just just gotta dig it out and start using it and you know using it in prayer you'd be amazed you know how fast that that, that comes back so any more geeseness came up, we do Kazian. Then the gum, the war, the war, no man, more than Jama dying over it and the yang and the Bushang and the Ajang. She be which can no year more of the dung, the nag, the nag zet the mech and egg the nanum, whether he know than the beans, the beans come back where the nanum no hung on it and the Ajang with no maguic. Yeah. And don't ask me to translate that. <laughs> Thanks, Denise. Nice to see you. I'll, I'll um, sing a song of my grandfather who, who sang these songs in a trap line. You know, a lot of a lot of years our way of life uh, became dormant and it was against the law is just 
things are happening so fast now. I think uh, you know we're trying to catch up with a lot of stuff. But slowly, it's you know the more confidence these people are, they begin to speak. You know, I the Yibash dogs are seeing the you know we're not retarded, stupid, or lazy. You know, we're just Nishnabe. You know, what a Nishnabe means a good person to me. You know, and they know Mad's is a good life. So I think that's all that's all that counts, you know, in day to day survival. Aha. Uh -huh. So it, um, I know we had over 43 questions in the Q&A and several questions and comments in the, in the chat. Um, we will be collecting all those questions because they will inform us for future topics um, that when we come together. So my apologies, we couldn't get to everybody, um, but I just wanna thank you for participating actively in, in our event today and our, and our time to come together and learning. Um, so it is my pleasure um, to thank both of our elders who joined us today, um, our, our teacher for the day, um, Isaac Murdoch, and, uh, you know, just a, a big chimigwech for taking the time to join us in this celebration of winter season. Um, I'm in Thunder Bay at the moment, and it is sunny and cold. And it feels like all the good things that winter should be. So um, I hope you are just all staying well, nurturing your spirit, looking after yourself, your friends and your family. And I would like to um, say miigwech again for joining us. And please um, check our, our website out, check out Isaac's. Uh, he has a big social media space, but he also has uh, books that he's been uh, sharing so that you can spend some time reading. I know it's not the same as listening to the oral story, but it is still another way to, um, to have that learning opportunity. So miigwech. And uh, on behalf of Lakehead University, I would just like to uh, wish you all a wonderful day. <laughs>